All right. Well, let's bring in our panel this afternoon, our panel of political strategists, Graham Morris and Bruce Hawker. Very good afternoon to both of you. Thanks for joining us. Day one in the Prime Minister's chair for uh, Scott Morrison today, uh, certainly in Parliament at least. How do you think he went, Graham? Well, look, we were led to believe that the Labor Party was going to come in, they were going to be Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, Rocky, and they ended up more like the wimpy kid. Um, yeah, there were huge expectations there, but they got a bit lazy. It was this, the sort of questions they were asking could have been asked, you know, 10 days ago. Nobody had done their homework. Um, it, it ended up a bit of a neutral, which the backbench and the government was pleased with, because they too were worried where this day was going to go. And, and the, the, the PM got through it. Labor, Labor sort of did the orthodox. Didn't go anywhere. Well, I didn't see a lot of cheering on the backbench, I must admit, today, sitting there in the chamber. There was a lot of glum faces still. But, uh, Bruce, uh, were you expecting a little more from Labor? I mean, how did you see it? Well, I think it's only so far you can go with the question that, uh, that they led with, and I thought it was a beauty, uh, you know... <laughs> Why are you the uh, Prime Minister? And he really didn't have an answer. He waffled on that and finally came out and basically said because he thought he could lead, lead him to the next election better than Turnbull could. Uh, so it's taken him a long time to actually um, come to that point where he's been, uh, been prepared to say that. So, look, I don't think it was brilliant. I don't think it was devastating. Uh, it, was, it was just a pedestrian performance. Yeah, can, yeah, can, I I answer, you, can, yeah. can I answer the why, the why question? Yes, please. The, the, the why question is very difficult for the Prime Minister to answer. A, he wasn't... He, he, he didn't cause the coup, neither the Deputy Prime <laughs> Minister. But the why is quite... The why is quite simple. The why... why the why was, was what, half of what Matthias Cormann said, and that was it was painfully obvious the party was not going to galvanise and unite behind Malcolm Turnbull. Now, Scott's already done that. Oh, really? And the other... Which the other, which um, Scott can't say, and a few others can, and that is the two big campaigns Malcolm Turnbull has had, the Republic and the last federal election, were absolute shockers, both of them. And people know that when we get to the election, election campaign, if the polls do close, Scott will do a good job in a campaign. So, uh, breaking it down, you're saying it's because Turnbull was a rotten campaigner and couldn't control the party. That's right. Well, not control the party, could not unite the forces within the party. That's why the oh, change was. Okay. And that's impossible for the Prime Minister to say or some of his mates. Well, I think he can say it, but the problem is he hasn't united the party. There's no evidence of that happening. Look at what's happening with uh, the female members of the, of, the, of the Liberal Party caucus now. They're making a big noise about what's going on. Dutton's clearly under pressure and unhappy. Uh, you know, there's leaking going on within the government or certainly a perception of that happening. So That's, that's, that, that's, that's just a couple of disgruntled sa well, staffers and one public servant. That's it's what, not, it isn't his colleagues. That's what you were saying when Turnbull was the Prime Minister, it was just a couple of disgruntled types. But the fact is that this is not a government which is in any way united. It may get to the point where it's united, but right now it's not. It's very sloppy and the electorate has spoken in a very comprehensive way, most recently, of course, in the Wagga by-election, where uh, a number of factors were at play, well, but most certainly... Look, partly, I want to come uh, to the Wagga by-election. Just, just on the news poll today, maybe we can bring those numbers back up, but, um, Graham. Uh, we, uh, I don't know if yeah, you're expecting yeah. a honeymoon for Morrison, but what no, do you no. make of it? They're pretty bad figures. Yeah, it, look, the raw figures are still bad. You know, the hope was that he would, he would, you know, as soon as possible, pick up a few of those disaffected thing, people and then work on those sort of people who floated across to the Labor Party. Yeah. That could still happen. But after, what is it, two weeks, yeah. he is in front as preferred Prime Minister, but on the three magic criteria, strong, trustworthy and likeable, Scott Morrison kills Bill Shorten. They are three very important ingredients look, in elections. Yeah, I, I, I certainly don't um, discount them as unimportant. But, yeah, look, those, the, their goals numbers, but elections are terrible. decided on, you know, the, the primary vote and then the two-party vote, vote as a result of that. Um, and, Bruce, that would, you know, be pretty encouraging to Labor to see those. But w what do you say to that popularity contest, the head-to-head? -head? I mean, okay. two weeks in and he's so far ahead of Bill Shorten, it's not funny. Okay. I actually went back and had a little bit of a look at some of the uh, the numbers around popular uh, prime ministers and unpopular opposition leaders. Now, for example, uh, Bob Carr, when he was uh, opposition leader in New South Wales, never once was more popular than the prime, uh, the, the premier uh, Griner or, or Fay. 
Yep. Uh, but he went on to be the longest serving Labor Premier in the history of New South Wales. When Kevin Rudd uh, came back in 2013 as Prime Minister, he was more popular than opposition leader Tony Abbott in every news poll that was conducted between when he became Prime Minister and when he uh, lost mm -hmm. the election, except for the last week. So you have to be very careful about mm -hmm. looking at those numbers and saying that that is a reflection on what's going to happen in the election. You yeah. can't make that prediction at all. What you can look at is the two-party preferred, and it's devastatingly bad for the government. Why? Because the electorate still regards them as divided. Yeah, and, and Graham, that's the bottom line, isn't it? I mean, Tony Abbott, as Bruce says, was didn't lead as preferred Prime Minister until the very end. Um, that's not what decides the election result. No, but I'm beginning to think it is more important now than it used to be. With, with all this social media and people deciding on personalities, I, I, I agree, it's not the be-all and end-all, but it is an ingredient, and if we get to December and the polls close, as they will, um, Labor's going to have to think about it. All right, look, a couple of by-elections then. Let's uh, talk about the Wagga. New South Wales uh, <laughs> Liberals thumped, Graham. Uh, what was the swing? Uh, Nearly 30%. Yeah, well, look, as the inaugural vice president of the Woggy Young Liberals and a former journalist from the Wagga Wagga Daily Advertiser, that town is responsible for me being in politics, and that result was a shocker. Um, but They're it's, getting it's, their revenge, it's what finally. You get. <laughs> uh, what do you look, put it down look, to? Look, right? it's, it's what you get when you have a former, former incumbent minister yeah. who got into trouble on corruption things and overlaid... That's the state stuff overlaid was the federal stuff. We sort of sucked all the oxygen out of the Wagga advertiser and all the other news because who's worried about what's happening in a little by-election because, hang on, the Libs are changing leaders all over the place. Yeah. That combination was just deadly. But it tells you... And, and it wasn't the greatest campaign in the world. Well, either. Bruce, let me get your thoughts on the Wagga by-election because mm. I want to talk about Wentworth as well. Uh, but, I mean, do you agree that it was kind of both? I mean, I know the state government's blaming the feds and the federal government's yeah, yeah. blaming the state, but yeah. it was kind of both. It, it was kind of both, and the, and the federal issue was so big it was obviously going to wash over into uh, the Wagga by-election. Having said that, there are very real issues in regional New South Wales uh, that where the, the, the electorates, not just here, but uh, not just in Wagga, but say in Orange, where there was a 35% swing, feel very disaffected with the Berejiklian government. You can't discount that. And uh, they only have to look at the stadiums that they're building and rebuilding in New South Wales in Sydney at uh, the cost of billions of dollars and getting nothing of the bush to make them... Uh, say in the bush, well, you know, what is this government doing to represent us? And they didn't allow the National Party to run a candidate. So there were very specific state just issues that, there. Yeah, the, the, the Nats obviously are pretty miffed at all of this, and John Barillaro has been making some of that clear, the, the state Nats leader there in New South Wales. Um, I assume, Graham, they will run the Nats uh, next time because it's, it's now regarded a vacant seat as far as the coalition is concerned. Yeah, I, th I think so, unless there's some extra agreement. But yes, I would have thought the Nats... Does, would, it, does uh, that actually help them, having two candidates in the field of Nat and mm, Lib and preference each other? It, it may, but you can make a case that a good, strong Nat candidate um, could make sure that the Libs aren't there for a generation or two. But the problem yeah, in New well, South well, Wales... Well. Just, just quickly, the problem in New South Wales for three-corner contests is that we have optional preferential voting. So you might find people voting Nat and then not putting a two beside the Liberal candidate... Uh, and vice versa, and that could be devastating for their vote. Look, now, given we all agree that the leadership turmoil federally played at least a part in the Wagga by-election, I want to then talk about the Wentworth by-election. We still don't have a date for it, but presumably late October. I, you know, I tend to discount the, that poll that was taken immediately after Turnbull was um, dumped. Uh, nonetheless, it's going to be fascinating and the Liberals will be under pressure unless they can pick up their uh, socks. Graham, how worried would you be for the Liberals about Wentworth. How hard do you... Or how worried would you be about it being lost? Yeah, very, very, in this sort of climate. You know, either way, the Coalition's going to have a... Oh, the Liberals are going to have a damn good candidate. You know, that is a very, very strong field. But once and a you, woman, one, do you think? A woman, given Andrew Bragg? Well, it may well be. Either Catherine O'Regan or Mary Lou Jarvis. It would be fantastic. So it should be a woman, you think? Oh, oh I'm not a pre-selector and I'm not, I'm not one of those people who's a great believer in, hey it's time for a woman, because then that woman is only there to make up the numbers. Have a look at the, some of the dregs behind Bill Shorten who were just there to make up the numbers. No, these two women, if they get there, will be there in their own right. But in this climate, it's very, very difficult. 
But I hope it is sort of one of the, one of the two women because they're more interesting and in a by-election, that sort of interest in the candidate becomes magnified hugely and they're both good operators. Well, uh, Bruce, on the question of how tight it's likely to be there in, mm. in Wentworth, what do you think? Is it really going to be that close? I think it could be. Uh, you see, we've got a, uh, an independent most likely running. I think Karen Phelps is most, hasn't said she's not running. So uh, if she were to run, then that would be a strong uh, position that she'd be able to adopt, particularly down in the Oxford Street, Taylor Square end of, uh, of Wentworth because it runs away from the beach down towards the CBD and into uh, the edges of King's Cross. Uh, Labor's got a, a strong candidate who has got a background in, uh, in finance and, and has spent a lot of time overseas, would fit the, the, uh, the demographic and a lot of the social attitudes uh, of people in Wentworth, which is a socially progressive uh, electorate, but a fiscally conservative one. So it could come down... I, I don't think... I don't think, so, I don't think there's any doubt if Dr Phelps ran, her preferences would decide the seat. Yeah, I think that's right. I think she would probably come third, and, uh, and if she preferenced Labor, then that could be a very interesting outcome. And, well, Bruce, I mean, Graeme mentions there we need, you need an interesting candidate. Do you think Labor's got an interesting candidate? Yeah, yeah. The, the candidate is uh, has had a background in uh, in finance. It was living in China for twenty years. Uh, and, well, I think for that electorate, yes, because it says he, he fits that sort of demographic that you see in in Wentworth. It's uh, an electorate where you know there's a lot of entrepreneurs, there's a lot of sort of go get them types, and they haven't put a union official up. They've put a, a a person with a background in business and finance, which really fits with a lot of the people in that electorate, and he's socially progressive. So I think that's where he's going to make a mark. On top of that, of course, you've got this huge disaffected uh, feeling inside the electorate amongst Liberal voters and amongst the electorate generally that a person who they actually liked in Malcolm Turnbull has been, uh, been forced out of the Prime Ministership and therefore the seat. Yeah, and um, just coming back <coughs> to Andrew Bragg, uh, Graeme, what did you make of his and what is it, move as I, today? Well, look, as I said on this program last week, it's the, it's the wrong election for him. He didn't have the local numbers. He has a bit of baggage and he's got to talk, sort all that out um, <coughs> before he runs again. And, you know, if he, if he walks away and says, you know, one of, the, one of the two women should be the candidate, well, that's fine. But it helps to have the numbers. Can he then... There's a bit of speculation about this today. Can he then turn around and be on the Senate ticket, uh, number one or two, for, for the Liberals? Well, good luck. He's up against a pretty flash team there, too. <laughs> All right. Yeah. We shall see. Uh, we'll let you go get a glass of water there, Bruce, uh, and wrap it up. We'll catch you both next week. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce Hawker, Graham Morris. Talk again soon. See you, mate. All right, we're going to take a quick break, in fact, and come back with the last word. <laughs> 